based on the injuries that we found on Health and Susanna at the time of autopsy, they had both sustained numerous stab wounds. Susanna had been stabbed 11 times and Health had been stabbed 10 times on various portions of their body. Their throats had been cut. A stabbing is, is a very personal crime. Uh, it's not something that you can accomplish at a distance of 12, 13, 14 feet like you can with a firearm. A stabbing is uh, something that's a very personal crime. You have to get up close to the individual to be able to affect the damage that the offender wants to affect on these people. There were fingerprints uh, developed on the back of one of the night sheaths left in the Zantop study. We then searched those fingerprints through the fingerprint identification system in our laboratory. The blade itself is, is really uh, a paramilitary or a tactical type of uh, tool. Our armed forces use them, a lot of police agencies utilize them. This is not something that uh, is a tool that's going to be used by the average hiker or the average individual. We were going to have to track down approximately 5,000 blades and knives that were produced and distributed worldwide. The Zantop just happened to be in the wrong place in the wrong time in their own home. Investigators are searching for some way to explain why Tullock and Parker murdered the Zantop so brutally. FBI profiler James Fitzgerald sees this type of random violence as part of a terrifying trend. We live in a different society today. Even in our youthful culture, they're constantly exposed to violence. So I know, let's go out and just hurt or kill someone. And we're seeing more and more of that, unfortunately. We spent a considerable amount of time within several days as he went through how he and Robert Tulloch had concocted and eventually perpetrated this crime. He showed no signs of emotion, no signs of remorse for what he had done. They were from more or less a middle class environment, low crime uh, area, did not have uh, some of the pitfalls that maybe others may be forced to experience. And, but nonetheless, there was a dysfunctionality about them. And when their chemistry was mixed, a violent outcome was apparently inevitable. This is True Crime Brewery, and I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Welcome to a Wednesday edition of True Crime Brewery. And today's episode, Without Motive, The Dartmouth College Murders. So the brutal double homicide of two Dartmouth College professors, Half and Suzanne Zantop, was at the hands of two high school students, and it shocked and disturbed the small village of Etna, New Hampshire, where the couple had lived. It was a cold-blooded crime, and it was perpetrated against kind and friendly strangers. As word of the crime reached the national and international media, the mental states, as well as the motives of the unlikely killers, were ultimately questioned. Maybe if we could explain these heinous acts with some kind of rare diagnosis or extraordinary motives, we could characterize and file the case in the backs of our minds, allowing us to feel safe in our own homes, like this type of thing wouldn't affect us. Yeah, but you're not going to be able to do that. But the murders were short on motive, and the murderous teen's callous brutality left no solid predictors behind. Definitely not. So this was a crime that not only broke our hearts, but it puzzled our minds. Our discussion will address the generous and productive lives of the Xantops, and Dick will also help us out to advance our understanding of adolescent minds and also the mind of an adolescent psychopath. So it should be an interesting discussion today. So first of all, I'm going to do a five-star review, and then I'll let Dick do his thing. Sound good, Dick? Sounds good to me. Okay. So our five-star review is from David Hours, and David says, I love listening to you guys when I'm at work. I wish Google Play would let you leave reviews because you two are gold. I don't know why some people are so hard on Dick. He has that tone and attitude that reminds me of Clancy Brown. I love the beer reviews, and I loved seeing Sprecher. Is that the beer Sprecher? Sprecher. Sprecher mentioned the other week. That brewery is right by my house. I would love to send you some more Milwaukee beers. We have more than just Miller, Paps, Blatz, and Schlitz. I would love it if you drank one of my favorites, Bridgeburner, made by Lakefront Brewery. 
I also hope you both do a special on Jeffrey Dahmer, since it's our most notorious killer in this area. I would love to hear your in-depth take on his crimes. Keep up the great work. That's very nice. I thought so. And I, I think we've we've toyed with the idea of doing serial killers, so Jeffrey Dahmer would certainly be on that list. I'm sure we'll get to it at some point. I don't know if we'll make a series of it, or if they'll just be sprinkled in here and there. Right, but I think we're going to do that. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get to him. So, welcome to the brewery, David. Thank you, David. What have we got for a beer today, Dick? We have a New Hampshire beer. The crime took place in New Hampshire, around Dartmouth College. So, I picked a beer called Company, which is brewed by Henniker Brewing Company in Henniker, New Hampshire. And the beer is a quad, which is short for quadrupel. So these are beers that are inspired by the Trappist brewers, the monks of Belgium. Quad is a Belgian-style ale of great strength with bolder flavor as compared to its brother and sister double and triple styles. They're typically dark with hues of deep red, brown, and garnet. They're full-bodied with a rich malt palate. They tend to be sweet and not bitter. And they tend to have a pretty noticeable alcohol content. So Quad by Henniker. Uh, is served in a goblet. We're, we're going to be fancy. A goblet? Wow. Yeah, I know. Going all out today. So it could be made of silver or gold, or do they have glass goblets? Well, this is a glass goblet. Okay. I don't have I left my silver one at home. Well, it just sounds very Game of Thrones-ish. Yeah, exactly. So this, this beer company is a reddish-brown color. Really no head to speak of. There's a complex of aroma. It's very interesting. There's some dark fruit, a little spice, some leather, of all things, and alcohol. Again, noticeable alcohol. The taste is raisins and plums, a little bit of nutmeg. There's a tannic sensation to the taste, and that old alcohol is coming through. Now, despite that, despite the alcohol that you can easily tell, it's a very smooth beer, very easy to drink, a lovely beer. It's a style that I think is underappreciated, but a uh, very good beer. Okay. Well, I think we should open it up and try it. Let's do that. Okay, wonderful. So let's take your goblet and head on down to the quiet end of the bar. It's early afternoon. It looks pretty relaxed down there. Yeah, and we will talk about without motive. Okay. So Suzanne and Half Zantop, they actually met each other. Back when they were students at Stanford University, this was back in the 1960s. Suzanne was working on her master's degree in political science. Hoff would earn a geology Ph.D. in 1969. So they married in 1970. They had two daughters, Veronica and Mariana. Suzanne taught in the German department at Dartmouth College, and she was also the chair of the German faculty. Hoff had served as a senior geologist for Kennecott Corporation and Bethlehem Steel Corp. from 1969 to 1975. He was a research fellow in ore microscopy, and that was at the University of Heidelberg from 1975 to 1976. So Hoff joined the faculty of Dartmouth with his wife, and he was in Earth Sciences Department, and that was in 1976. So before joining the Dartmouth faculty, Suzanne had received her doctorate as well, and hers was in comparative literature that was at Harvard. So that's pretty impressive. So obviously these were very hardworking and accomplished people, and they were also very well liked. They were respected members of the Dartmouth community. So this turned out to be a really unusual situation. The Zantops are not in any way that you could think of typical victims to violent crime. Also, their ages. Hoff was 62 years old and Suzanne was 55. So they were just beginning to talk about retiring in a few years when this tragedy happened. That's right. I mean, they, they certainly weren't typical victims. No. Uh, these are both highly educated people. Both have doctorates. Right. Uh, they've taught at Dartmouth for many, many years. Everything I read about them, nobody had anything bad to say about the couple. No, not at all. They really had many friends. Students really looked up to them. Very few people would have had anything negative to say, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just really a shame that this happened. A very big shame. Yeah. 
so the, the perpetrators of this murder were high school students, James Parker and Robert Tulloch. These are kids that lived kind of across the Connecticut River in Chelsea, Vermont. Very small town. Tiny town, right? Tiny town. Yeah. They first conceived of a plan to rob and kill people in June of 2000. They were hoping to clear $10,000 by robbing and killing people for their ATM cards so they could move to Australia. They had envisioned themselves as, as explorers. Okay. And they were, you know, they, they were kind of best friends. They hung out with other kids for a while, but uh, as they got into high school, they became more and more uh, just the two of them. Not that they exactly left all their friends behind, but they just didn't have the big group right. that they used to have. Yeah, they were kind of starting to have their own plans together, which maybe the other kids weren't into. Right. Yeah. And initially, it wasn't even that they had to kill somebody. They were going to tie them up and get their ATM cards and get their PIN numbers and withdraw money. And then they got the idea, well, we need to kill them also. Yeah, and I think that from what I read, Robert Tulloch was the one who was kind of leaning towards that and pushing towards it. And I yeah. don't say that to excuse Jim Parker. I'm just saying I think he might have been the leader in this endeavor. Tulloch was definitely the leader. Yeah. I mean, they were a year apart. Parker was 16, wasn't considered a troublemaker by any means. 17-year-old Robert Tulloch, uh, also not a troublemaker, but uh, had kind of an edge to him and, and did some things. He uh, was a ringleader on some break-ins in houses, theft of a truck, you know, just, I don't want to say typical teenage crimes, but... No. You know, petty crime stuff, and, and he was the, the ringleader for these things. Yeah, and that was a big issue there, which is kind of surprising, but an issue was that these kids were bored, that there was really nothing to do. And that certainly doesn't excuse any kind of crime, but it's something that the town considered after all this happened, is what's happening to our teenagers? What kind of direction can we give them? They seemed like they were kind of out on their own a bit. Well, they were, quite a bit, and uh, some of that was also the way the school system was working. The high school had block scheduling, and you could take classes and, and be done with school for the day by noontime or so. Both these kids had taken courses for higher higher grades when they were in junior high school and early high school. So I know Tulloch had, had like pretty much graduated, even though he wasn't a senior. Yeah, I think he had like one or two credits left to yeah, do. Yeah, very little. And, yeah. and Parker had some advanced credit also. He wasn't to the whole extent that uh, Tulloch was. But you know, both of these kids kind of could come and go as they pleased about school. Yeah. And they, you know, they did some odd jobs, but no, it doesn't sound like they worked that much. Yeah, I wonder if there were many places to even work there, if it's a small town. Well... Uh, as I said, it's a small town, but there was all these things to do. Yeah. There's farming to do. There's dairy, you know, milk cows. Plenty of work. Well, but neither of them were from farming families. I guess they could have gone no. to farms and offered to work. Sure. Yeah. yeah. There's was, there was plenty of work. They, yeah. They didn't, I don't think, they didn't want it, want to work. Well, no. They wanted to make the money, but they didn't want to work and take their time to earn it. Right. Right. So the, the parents, Robert Tulloch's parents, mom was a home nurse. Yeah. Uh, she had gotten her nursing degree sometime into the marriage. Right. I think when her kids got older, she went back to school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and dad was a carpenter. He was uh, exceedingly shy, very difficult to engage in conversation. Yes. He has or had, does have, two older sisters and a younger brother. And this is Tulloch we're talking this about. This is still Tulloch. Okay. He was a popular kid, but not particularly likable. Yeah, I which is strange. It is. I mean, he did a lot of things with people, but again, he had an edge to him, and he could, he could be kind of mean to people. Seems like it, yeah. Sarcastic. Right. Yeah. He, he did get elected to a, a class president, I think his junior year, but was uninvolved and rude to people. And his other student council members wanted to impeach him. There was a, a big meeting at school about that one, one day in late winter, early spring. Yeah, and I guess the head teacher, whoever decided that they weren't going to impeach him, but 
He really wasn't doing what he was expected. And he was also a member of the school debate team. Right. Which he was pretty good at, but he was frequently unprepared. And sometimes he would use insults and sarcastic remarks against his opponents instead of information. Right. Right. And he he didn't follow the rules of engagement in debate. Not necessarily, no. You're supposed to respect your opponent and be considerate and courteous to them. Yeah, and he and could be quite disrespectful. He could. He he would make these ad hominem attacks at people. He he tore apart some little high school freshmen. Yeah. In one of the debates, as the, a, as a judge, he, right? He could be quite mean. Yeah, and the German exchange student at one, he said, "Well, what do you know? You're just German or something. Right. Something very dismissive." Yeah. And yeah, and then also I read in the book that. When he and Jim got closer, Jim would go to the debate meetings and prep with him, and they would kind of make a mockery of things. Yeah. But there were so few kids to involve in it, the teacher was hesitant to get rid of Robert because he needed a debate team. He needed the team. So these kids were kind of taking advantage of the small town things that were going on in the school, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So when they got closer and started kind of toying with crime, there was this man named Andrew Patty. He was a resident of Vershire, Vermont. And he says that Parker and Tullock attempted to murder him and his family back in the summer of 2000. Right. I, I don't know if we mentioned it, but the murder took place in January of 2001. Right. Murderers. And they, they were doing some practice runs, or maybe not a practice run. They were intending to kill this guy and his son. They made some failed attempts, I would call right. it, yeah. They, uh, at least with Andrew Patty, they had dug graves. Isn't that scary? I, I find this story so haunting. This gives me the creeps more than anything we've done. I don't know why. Yeah. But it really does. But Tulloch was knocking on the door claiming that they had car trouble. Mm-hmm. And yep. Yep. Parker was in the hiding in the shrubbery. Right. And the plan was to gain entry to the house. Yeah. He told, Andrew Patty told investigators that on July 17th of 2000, Parker and Tulloch went to his isolated home intending to murder him and his son and steal their belongings. So, as you said, near the house they had dug graves for their intended victims. They were like six feet long, three feet deep, where they were going to put their victims. So I can't imagine what's going through their heads when they do this. They think this is okay. I don't get it. Yeah. These are supposedly normal kids. Well, I guess they weren't, but that's just something else. So it was kind of late at night, like you said, when Tollock knocked on the door, and Parker was waiting off to the side in the bushes. So Andrew, he was 47 years old. He was home with his 11-year-old son. And he was first alerted to the presence of the teens by his dog barking. So his dog was barking. It's kind of late at night. I think he was reading to his son or something. But he was suspicious at the late night knock. It was kind of an invasive, loud knock. Um, He's way out there. Nobody's around him. Yeah. So he answered the knock by going to the door and pulling back the window blinds. But he didn't open the door. But he did have a gun. So Tulloch was claiming to be a stranded motorist, and he asked to enter the house. Andrew refused, and after several more requests for entry, Andrew was getting really concerned, like this was weird. Very weird. Very insistent about getting in the house. So he held up his gun where Tollock could see it. And then he went to call the police. But when Andrew picked up his phone, the line was dead. So how creepy is that? Yeah, they had cut the phone lines. Yeah. Dug the graves. Yeah. Wow. So. And this is before everybody had a cell phone. Right. And there probably wasn't service out there anyway. You know, in 2001, way out in the boonies, probably not. Oh, no. No. So he returned to the door, but Tullock and Parker had left at that point. But he was really alarmed, and he ran upstairs to check the phone in the master bedroom. Took his 11-year-old with him, I mean. At this point, the 11-year-old's, like, clinging to his leg. He's terrified. And the phone up in the master bedroom, of course, was dead also. So Andrew knew they'd cut the outside lines, but he wouldn't go outside to look. You know, he had a gun, but he thought, you know, they could still jump me. He doesn't know how many are out there. Oh, yeah. So he actually said that that night he spent the night sitting on the floor listening. His son did finally fall asleep on the couch. 
and he was even afraid to sit on the couch because he might doze off. So he sat on the floor holding his gun until morning came. So that's just scares me so much. Yeah, it's just I mean, a, such a scary story to come that close. That is so eerie. It is terrible. Yeah. And like you said, no, no cell phones or anything. So it's the middle of the night. You have no idea if they're still around or not. Right. Or what they're, what they're doing, yeah. who they are. Yeah. Just, yeah. I know. It scares me. It makes me afraid at night since I've read about that. But we do have cell phones, so that helps. These days. These days, yep. yep. <laughs> so that was their first attempt. Right. Uh, that was about six months before the Zantop murders. Right, because the Zantops were in January of 2001. So right. it's about six months later. So they went to the Zantop residence the morning of January 27th of 2001. Now, didn't you say they stopped at someone else's before? Was that the same day? No, this, here, here's some other eerie stuff. Okay. They, they had stopped at a nearby house a week before. Oh, a week before, okay. And the, uh, owner of the house basically blew them off, said he was too busy to talk to them, and okay. went back inside. So we should say at this point they changed their story because the stranded motorist thing wasn't working. Right. They were going to pose as high school students doing research. To right. Using that to gain entry. Yes. So the the first place they went, again, this was a week before the Zantop murders. The guy, uh, an older gentleman, said, you know, I don't have time to do this right now. and just closed the door, and that was that. Right. So just kind of surprised them. A, a week later, they're back. They go to a house, I think, actually next door to the Zantops. Oh, another one. But it was it was still, I mean, next door, yes, but it was not side by side next door. Mm -hmm. But they went, they went to this house and nobody was home. The family was off skiing that day. Oh. So nobody, nobody answered the door. So they went to the Zantops. Right. So, I mean, look at the, the horrible coincidental stuff going on. Well, that makes it just so random that it was them, right? Right. They were completely random. And the people next door, that was a whole family. Right. And they had even said that the boys talked about if there were children, yes, they'd have to kill them as well. They were ready to do that. They, they were. Yep. So they go to the Zantops. They pose as students doing a research project for a school. They claim they're going to the mountain school. Yeah, now that was a private school. Yeah. Where some friends of theirs had done some extracurricular yeah, a of, stuff. A lot of kids from Chelsea went there and took a semester there or a year there. Okay. So they plan to take the occupants by surprise, threaten them into revealing their ATM pin numbers, rob them and kill them. Mm-hmm. How fancy the door. And here's this guy. He's a teacher. Yes. Uh, and he, he gets the story from, from Robert, from Tullock. That there's students, high school students doing research, and he's ready to, to help them out. Suzanne, his wife, was in the kitchen cooking. So, Half is talking with them, and they stab him. You're going right. to talk about that. Yeah, he turns uh, around to get a number, I guess, because he was trying to get information for the boys. Yeah, he was going to try to f talk to a colleague or a friend who could help them further. Right. He's stabbed. He's screaming as he's being stabbed. His wife comes running into the, the room from the kitchen. Parker grabs her. Yeah. And s slits her throat and stabs her, and she's dead. So both of them are dead. Yeah. When they had the, um, they had, um, a cue where Robert would say that he wanted something to drink, and that's when they would jump the people. Right. So they already didn't follow their plans because they've killed these people without getting their ATM numbers. Right. Jim just jumped on half with Robert when it first happened, and he reached into his backpack and took out his knife. Right. And part of it, I think, is an impulsive act. Well, sure. I think once they and got started, they were not thinking very clearly about right. their plan. They were, they were winging things. And the book we read, it, it sounded like Hoff was admonishing Tullock that you know, he wasn't very well prepared for doing the survey. Right. And, and it pissed Tullock off. Right. Which, the book which uh, probably made him take action a little quicker than they wanted. The other thing the book pointed out was that there 
they, they escaped with only the contents of Hans wallet, which was like 300 bucks. Right. A long way from the $10,000 they thought they needed. Sure. And there's artwork sitting in the house that's worth way, way more. There is a Rodin sculpture or something. Yeah, but what are they going to do with that? And they don't I, know. Well, they don't know. If right. they had known, right. they could have pawned it and gotten way more than $10,000 for the, the statue and the painting. Yeah, but where are these kids going to pawn those well, things? Well, they'd have to go. They wouldn't be able to. To Burlington or someplace. And, right. And, and they wouldn't, really. But there was a lot of money in that house. Yeah, and they never that, did that ask they for their realize. ATM numbers or anything. Nope. No. So here they are. Part of their plan is, has been carried out. Right. They've, they've gotten into a house. They've killed the occupants. But they only got $300. Right. They took his wallet. Yeah. Yeah. So when Tullock was repeatedly stabbing Hoff in the chest and face, that's when Jim jumped in, because Suzanne actually came running in to save her husband when she heard the screams. Right. Which I think is pretty brave. I think if I heard screaming like that, I might run away and try and get help. I don't know if I'd run towards it, which it turned out it wasn't an, a good idea anyway. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have worked either way, but it, it probably was unwise of her to go charging into the room. Yeah, it was probably just instinctual. Sure. I mean, why would she think these boys were killing him anyway? Yeah. According to Jim's story, he had pushed Suzanne away, and she was screaming and trying to break through, and Robert had said to him, slit her throat, yelled it at him. So Jim, at that point, he could have pulled Suzanne out of the study and saved her life, or he might have abandoned her and saved himself, but the idea of disobeying Robert had never really crossed his mind. So Robert's months-long seduction had succeeded, and now he had Jim right in there with him. Jim has killed somebody, right? So Jim's just as guilty as he is. Right. Even after they were dead, according to Jim, Robert wasn't done, and he actually just kept stabbing Hulk, which he called going animal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, stabbing him in the head. And then this was a bloodbath. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just really horrible. So the mission that they'd enlisted him in was to get these ATM cards, get the PIN numbers, and get money so they could go on this adventure. But then we wonder afterwards, is that really what Robert wanted, or did he just want to get Jim in with him to do a killing? Because he wanted to be a killer, it seems like. Yeah. I, well, I, I think both things are true. Yeah. Uh, I think probably the killing was the primary. Yeah. And, and the money was more secondary. But that's, I don't think that's what Jim thought. Right. Jim, right. Jim thought that, that the money was primary and the killings were secondary. It was kind of collateral damage, as it were. Yeah. So when they left, they were covered in blood. They had exactly $340. Right. And they had forgotten their knife sheaths. The sheaths remained the behind. Yeah which were easy to identify. They came with the knives. Yeah. So I mean, this is, as we go further along, this is pretty good detective work. Yeah. To, to figure out what had happened. Right. And Robert had uh, cut himself in his uh, knife slashing frenzy. He had a pretty nasty cut on his leg. Yes. From the knife. So he's, not only are they covered in blood, he's bleeding. Yep. Off they go. And then they say, oh, geez, we forgot the sheaths. They turn around and go back. Well, that's quite a bit later, yeah, when they're almost later. home, yeah. But as it turned out, the Xantops had invited someone over. For dinner. She arrives, and there's two dead people there. Yeah, their bodies were found in the evening by their family friend, Roxana Verona. She'd come to the home as an invited guest for dinner, and she found the doors unlocked, which she thought was strange because they always lock their doors. Right. The house was quiet. And when she walked towards the study, she saw the blood-drenched bodies of her friends. They were sprawled out right in their study. So she didn't know what had happened. Yeah. So she kind of freaked out, and she ran out of the house, went to her car, and then she drove to the nearest neighbor's house. So the nearest neighbors, they're Audrey and Robert McCollum, and they were actually having a birthday celebration for Robert. He was a retired dean at Dartmouth Medical School. And there was this sudden pounding on the door in the middle of their birthday party. And they let this distraught woman in, Roxana, 
and she told them what she'd seen at the Zantop home. Well, of course, they knew the Zantops. So Robert McCollum and his daughter Cindy, they drove immediately to the house to see if they could help. They didn't know if they were dead or not, right. what was going on. Yep. And then they found the couple obviously deceased on the floor of the study. So, of course, the police were called, and along with the forensic criminologist, the scene was immediately secured, so it was handled well. Yeah. And there was no sign of forced entry at their home. The door was unlocked. Nothing was broken. No windows broken into, of course. So that initially led the police to believe that the killer was someone that the couple had known. Sure. And there were many suspects who were quickly eliminated, people that they looked at. They interviewed Hulf's teaching assistant, Tom Douglas. Douglas pointed out someone he thought might have had a motive and the opportunity to kill the Zantops. Now, that person was a professor who'd earned graduate degrees at Dartmouth, and Douglas told detectives that this man had expressed a desire to work at Dartmouth and believed that the only position this man was qualified to hold there was the one that Hoff already held. Right. Right. So there, I guess that's kind of a motive. Well, it's a stretch. I guess it for sure a psychopath, is. it could be a motive. Yeah. But this guy wasn't a psychopath. No. No. I mean... It's, it's a big stretch to figure. He never, never said, I really want this job or anything. Turns out that if, if he were to get a job, a teaching position at Dartmouth, the only one that he'd be qualified was the one that was already occupied by Hoff. Right, so it's reason enough to at least talk to him. Yeah. So Douglas told police that the professor was in Hanover attending a party on the day the Zantops were murdered, which kind of makes me wonder, what did Douglas have against this guy? I know. Because he's kind of pushing them towards him, unless he really thought it was a concern, maybe, I guess. Well, probably. Yeah. I mean, they're looking... I mean, they're, they're certainly not thinking of two high school kids from Vermont That's as true. the perpetrators. So they're, they're looking at more likely people. And I guess the guy had the opportunity, because he was in Dartmouth or, or in Hanover. Right. And he may or may not have been wanting Hoff's job. So, yeah, I'd, I'd mention it. I don't know how strongly I'd push it. Sure. Well, detectives tracked down the rental car the man had driven during his stay in Hanover. And they did find a large card cardboard box in the trunk, and it had a suspicious reddish-brown stain on it. They also searched the home where the man had stayed. They got his fingerprints, they got a blood sample, and they interviewed him as well as his wife. His name was leaked to the media. And the Boston Globe actually ran a front page story which began, Investigators believe the killings of Dartmouth College professors, Halp and Suzanne Zantop, were crimes of passion, most likely resulting from an adulterous love affair involving Halp Zantop. Right. Yeah. I and mean, that's just... So that if, was... Um, if it wasn't such a tragedy, that, that headline would be laughable. Yeah. I mean, they really went out on a limb, making a lot of assumptions there. Yeah. So the next day, the Globe did retract its statements, and authorities dropped this man as a suspect. It turns out the stain on the box was just remnants of a spilled stew. Right. And there was no evidence that there was any adultery involved either. No. And no. There, was, there was no blood in this guy's car. Nothing. No blood on him. His fingerprints didn't match the print they had on the sheath, knife sheath. Yeah. So. so he was quickly eliminated, but it's too bad he had to go through that. No, isn't it? Yeah. So the two knife sheets that they left behind, they were found, of course, at the murder scene. Um, when the boys realized they'd forgotten them, they came back, and this was after the house guests had come. Right. And the police were already there. So there's already police there. So they left, obviously. So they're gone. Yep. So three weeks after the murders, the police traced the sheaths back to James Parker. Yeah, and it, it was just some intricate work. These are fairly specialized knives. Yes. Um, that Navy SEALs used, military types. And I think they started with a list of 5,000 knives. And they, they looked at different knife shops, or shops that sold the knives in the area. Right. Didn't find them. They did an internet search, and that's where they found the, the two knives um, that were sold to Jim. Yeah, they found a guy who had sold them nearby on the yeah. internet. Yep, they were looking for two knives because there were two sheaths there. So they were they were looking at somebody who had purchased two knives. Yep, yep. 
And bingo. And they got it. There's Jim Parker. So when they interviewed Parker, he told them that he'd bought the knives to build a fort with Tullock. But he said that they had turned around and sold them to a guy at a surplus store after finding that they were too heavy. So they didn't say they were selling them back to the store. They just said there was a stray guy there at the store. Right. Who they sold them to for 60 bucks each. Yeah, just, just some guy. Yeah. So Jim, Par- so Jim Parker at that point agreed to be fingerprinted. And investigators went on after that to interview Robert Tullock. At this point, they really didn't think the boys were involved. They just think that the boys were the source of the knives to whoever did do the killing. Yeah. So they're trying to track down who bought the knives from them or who yeah, bought Yeah, because they, they're, they're, they're looking at these two normal high school students and thinking they're, they're not the perpetrators. Sure. So they're, they're going to find out who this mysterious stranger was that they sold the knives to. Yeah. And one of the problems was that the story kept changing a little, or the description of the guy that they sold it them to kept, well, kept and with, changing a little. Yeah, and the thing with that was they thought maybe they were covering for someone they'd given the knives to. Right. Yeah. So Tulloch agreed to speak with investigators as well, and he gave an identical story almost as if it was rehearsed. And Which, which it was. Yes. So they did notice a deep cut above his right knee. He told them he'd slipped on a rock and cut himself on a metal spigot. But then it turns out he told different people different stories about that cut, we find out. Yeah. Well, in the, the spigot story, if you think about it, this, this was a tap in a maple tree for collecting sap oh, to make into maple that's syrup. That's what he was saying? Okay. So he said he cut it on, on one of those. Mm-hmm. That's a little far-fetched. And yeah. it, it wouldn't. You know, that type of spigot wouldn't leave a slice. It would leave more of a puncture wound. Yeah, I would think so. I wouldn't even think it would break the skin necessarily. Right. He told his sort of girlfriend that he had dropped a knife on his thigh. Yeah, yeah. Now that's, <laughs> I don't see how dropping it would give you that big a wound. But anyway, that's, yeah. that's one of the things he said. Yeah. So. And that girlfriend was a little suspicious when he said that too. Yes. But he went ahead and signed a search warrant, and he gave his fingerprints to them. And then they wanted to see his footwear, so he brought out his shoes that he had. And he did have a pair of these specialized hiking boots, which matched a footprint they found in the Zantop home, a footprint in the blood, which was from a boot. Yeah, he had a a style of boot called Vasque. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a fairly distinctive tread to it. Yep. That matched that in the Xantop home. Correct. And the size matched. Size matched. So this isn't looking too good, is it? Well, it looks like they're going to figure it out, so that's good. Yep. So this is when Parker and Tullock ran off the second time. They'd run off a little bit earlier. Yeah, the first time. And ended up coming back. They were going to take off and, and just head to California or someplace. Right. And they took the bus and they got as far as where, St. Louis or someplace? Something. Not far. Yeah. And then and realized here they were in the middle of the country with like $100 left to their names. Yeah. They weren't going to get very far. Well, and they were kind of whiny babies. Yeah. You know, they were cold. They didn't like the fast food, which is where the bus stopped. Right. You know, they were just kind of spoiled. So. And it wasn't this exciting adventure they thought it, it would be. It certainly wasn't. Right. Reality sets in. So home they go. Yeah, so they went back home. And then the second time, they know they're going to get caught because they've given their fingerprints, they've given the boots. So they know that they're in trouble. So when Jim leaves at night, he leaves a note for his parents, says something like, I needed to talk to Robert, but I'll be back. Don't call the cops. Right. Yeah, because the cops had questioned both boys and both families. Yes. And the boys knew that it was only a matter of time. Sure. The families had told the boys not to contact each other. Yep. This this was after they came back from the first aborted escape attempt. Right, right. You know, don't yep. have anything to do with each other, which they were continuing to do. Yeah, well, even though Jim's parents found the note right after Jim uh, drove away from their house, they didn't call the cops until the next morning. Right. They were hopeful that he would return, you know. In their defense, they thought he was innocent. So, actually, Jim's father, I think his name was John, 
he went out and checked at the Tullock's house for Robert and found out they were both gone. That right. Robert and Jim were gone. They both took off. So then finally in the morning they called the police when they couldn't find them. Yeah. And I guess there was a big flap because this was uh, police work between Vermont police and New Hampshire police. Yep. And uh, I forget who was pissed at who, but one state thought that the boys should have had uh, closer watch kept on them. Yes. Uh, and that they should have been put into custody or something, because now here they are gone. I think it was the Vermont police that had them and let them go, right? Because they'd gone to their homes. Right. So it was the New Hampshire police so the, that thought they should have held on to them. said, you should have kept them. Right. Which I think that was right, but they I, just didn't think they'd done anything. Yeah. They were yeah, just again taken off guard. Yeah. Yeah. But as it turns out, the boot matched the print. Right, and exactly. then the fingerprints matched. And the fingerprints on the sheaths matched. Right. And so. a, that's when they put out a warrant for Tullock. And they were also, they were looking for Parker. He was sought for questioning. He didn't actually have a warrant because he was still a minor, I guess. Yeah. But, of course, there, you know, there's a be on the lookout for both of them. Exactly. That they're dangerous people. Oh, and they had searched the, the houses and stuff, too, right? Oh, yeah, searched their homes. And they found the knives. Yeah, after they were gone, they found the knives. Because the boys boys took off, and they said, Oh, jeez, I forgot the knives. Yeah, I think it was Jim who had, was supposed to bring the knives with him. Yeah. And didn't think until later that he didn't bring the knives, so. Yeah. Just really stupid stuff. Yeah, I mean, not that it's going to change anything, because they have other evidence, but. Yeah, but that's there's, huge evidence. There's the murder weapon sitting right there. Right, right. So. Yeah, crazy. So there was a big thing there with the school and the families with them being missing and all this police attention in the town where people didn't know what was going on. Yeah. It caused quite an uproar. A huge uproar. Again, this is a town of, what, like 1,200 people or so. I think so. It's, it's pretty tiny. Like a lot of the students at the school thought that maybe they'd stolen a car or broke into a house. Right. They None of them connected it with the murders right away. No one whatsoever. No. And the parents really thought they were innocent, but the parents didn't know about all the evidence. Not yet. As with most of the townspeople didn't. Right. So, um, yeah, so the boys, they actually abandoned Jim's car at a truck stop in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, they didn't have that much money. No, uh, they even had less this time. And, and except for the fact that this time they were fleeing for their lives. Yes. Um. Uh, they probably would have quit this time, too. Oh, sure. But they figured out they, they had stopped somewhere for gas and decided they, they couldn't keep driving the car. They asked where they could hitch a ride with a trucker. Got yeah. Got directed to Sturbridge. Well, and it was hard to get someone to drive them because apparently it's against the rules for trucking companies to pick up hitchhikers, to have people riding in your car. Right. In your truck. So most people wouldn't do it. But they ended up riding to New Jersey with... um. A couple, a man and a wife, who did long-distance trucking together. Mm -hmm. So they let them ride in the back, and they actually napped in the back of their truck. These people were quite kind to them. They were. They gave money for food. Yeah. And they helped them find another ride. Yeah, they went over the CB trying to find a ride for them to take them further, because at this point they wanted to go to California. Right. So they got, they got another trucker to pick them up, and they went into Indiana. Okay. And he was heading from there into Chicago. So he... Who's was he? The truck driver? The truck driver. Okay. So he's, he's again, calling around looking for somebody to take the boys further. Oh, and, okay. And here's some other cool police work <laughs> that they, they uh, somehow discovered the car at the Sturbridge truck stop. And found out from talking to witnesses that the boys had been there and had taken a ride with a trucker. Yeah, apparently the boys had been there a while. They'd sat yeah. there. They'd used the bathroom to brush their teeth and stuff. Right. Looking for a ride. So they were looking suspicious to people at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they'd they found a ride. So the, the police are tracking them through the, the truckers' companies. And when the, the last trucker who gave them the lift in New Ohio was calling around, a policeman got on the CB radio, pretended to be a trucker, oh, and said, "I'll pick them up." Right. Now this was um was this the policeman that was off duty? Yeah. Yeah, that was cool that he did that. 
It was. It was pretty amazing how that worked, yeah. So he calls the rest of the police, and they drive into the truck stop in Indiana, and there's the two boys, and boom, they're, <laughs> they're caught. Yeah. Yeah, they tried to give fake names at first. <laughs> yeah. They, they couldn't even do that right. No, they couldn't. <laughs> they couldn't say their names right, and then one of them said he was from Encino and spelled it wrong. Right. Yeah. And I think he got his birth year wrong, too. Yeah. I was just, just a mess. Yeah. A mess. Yeah. And and Parker was crying and just really deeply distraught. Yes. And Tulloch was acting the tough guy. Right. But I still think that Jim Parker didn't seem that upset that he killed people. He seemed more upset that his life was ruined. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They both did. Yeah. So after they were captured, there was all this activity with the town, with the families, just Families believing he was innocent. Yeah, because so, the families, nobody in town knew what the evidence showed yet. No, they didn't, and they really couldn't believe that these boys had done it. And, of course, we're not going to believe that these two great kids, these two great high school students, were guilty of such a horrific murder. Right, right. There was some division, but it was pretty much supportive. It was very supportive, at least at first. At least at first, until the evidence got leaked. Well, there was this psychiatrist in town, Dr. Andy Pomerant, and he decided that they should have some town meetings where parents and families could get together to deal with this whole situation. Right. So they actually were thinking about doing a defense fund, but some people were against that and didn't really think that was the right thing to do. No. No. Well, and they had state-appointed attorneys. Yes, and we don't know if they were innocent, so a lot of people didn't think that they should defend them unless they were definitely innocent, and many people thought maybe they weren't innocent. Yeah. So, But they did start a family expense fund for the families, and they were very kind to the families, even when they found out the boys were guilty, which was nice. They didn't ostracize the parents and the siblings. No. I mean, when the evidence came out that it, it looked pretty certain that these boys had done the crime, they still were kind to the families. Yes. And can you imagine what you're going through as a parent? No, of, I can't. These, one of these kids? Holy cow. Yeah. Well, the Tulloch family attorney who was helping out in the beginning, Dan Se Seedon, he went to the town meeting. And he was just kind of listening, but he knew of the evidence and the other people didn't. Right. So he was a bit incredulous that they were this supportive and thought the boys were so innocent. But, you know, he understood that. They just couldn't wrap their heads around the idea that Robert and Jim had killed people. It had to be a misunderstanding, most of them thought. Sure. Yeah. So the residents voiced concern about the teens in the beginning, and then when more of the evidence came out, they had more concern for the families. Exactly. One thing I found interesting at that first meeting, there was a flip chart so that the psychiatrist and people could write down ideas and feelings about what was going on. So this flip chart, they ended up turning into a, a card for the boys. Right. Yeah, someone had suggested sending cards to the boys, and they weren't sure that was appropriate. And then they thought, well, we'll just put our thoughts down yeah. on this flip chart, which people, some people still thought was inappropriate. Yeah, Dan Seaton said that writing a note to the boys on the flip chart really took him back. He hadn't expected the atmosphere to be so pro-Robert, pro-Jimmy. No, but no. Th there was still a significant number of people that didn't approve of that. No, some people left without signing the card. Right. But many people did sign the card. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, this, this was before the evidence became known. Right, right. Yeah. And then um, as far as the teen boys or the young men, Parker was actually declared an adult soon after being captured. And he eventually decided to take a plea bargain that was offered to him if he would testify against Tulloch. Right. So he took that plea, gar plea bargain and pled guilty to second-degree murder. So that gave him a minimum of 25 years. So his first date for possible parole is in 2026. He'll be 41. Okay. So that's not too terrible. No. Considering what he did. Yeah, and he provided information to the police that uh, was kind of essential for the case. Yes. And didn't paint 
Mr. Tullock in too good a light, did it? No. And there was actually a guy who was in the jail with Tullock. They had put in a undercover police officer with him in jail, but he hadn't said anything to him. Right. But then there turned out to be another fellow inmate who went to police saying that Tullock had told him he did the crimes. Yeah. And he actually testified against him and didn't get anything in return. Nope. Yep. He wasn't one of those quid pro quo things where you got a reduced sentence or something. He, he still paid. Yeah, he would have liked that, but that yeah. wasn't offered, and he, he spoke anyway. He did. Because he found it really disturbing that he was bragging about this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because according to Jim, after they killed the Xantops, Jim wanted to, I mean, Robert wanted to continue and kill more people, yeah. do more crimes to get more money. Right. We only only got this little amount. We need to keep on killing people and taking their money. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they might have if they hadn't gotten caught. And and Tulloch eventually pled guilty. They were yeah. thinking of offering up an insanity defense. Yeah, that didn't work. Which, well, it, it never has worked. I mean, <laughs> I, the, the book went into some detail about this. Uh, New Hampshire's laws in, in terms of an insanity defense are, are quite liberal. Uh, really? What do you mean? Uh, in terms of the definition of insanity. Okay, but it still doesn't work. Uh, but despite it being a fairly liberal interpretation, it's never worked Oh. in New Hampshire. Okay. So, but they had a psychiatrist ready to testify that Tulloch had bipolar disorder and he had killed the Xantops in the midst of a manic phase of his bipolar disorder. But that's not insanity. Well, as as it turns out, he they realized that the insanity defense wasn't going to work. Right. And I think there was some pressure from the parents because they didn't want all their family doings being testified to. What do you mean? Well, the, in, in order to have the insanity defense, they were going to have to show that there was a history of mental illness in the family. Well, God, and, that would seem like a small thing to do to save your child from right. a life in prison. That's weird. And the father had depression, had a suicide attempt, uh, had alcoholism in his past. This was the real quiet guy. Right. Mike. And he had a sister who had some sort of a pervasive developmental delay. It sounded like she was somewhat autistic. Yes. So part of the, the things were, besides the fact that the insanity defense had never worked, was that they didn't want uh, people probing into their private lives that much. Okay. So he pled guilty. Yeah, he pled guilty to first-degree murder, and he right. got life without parole, no chance of parole. Right. Which is probably a good thing. Yeah, I think from what we've read, he hasn't been a model prisoner. No. I mean, Parker's been okay. He's gotten his high school diploma or completed high school work. Yeah. He well, his family helped him to do that when he was in jail. Right. They provided him with a therapist who could visit him and help him through all this. Yeah. He seemed to have um, a really helpful family. He continued being interested in music. Mm-hmm. Uh, meanwhile, Tulloch mouthed off, had plans for escaping the jail, got into fights. Not a good guy. Not a good guy. No, he actually talked about escaping and how he would wait for Jim being transported to his prison, and then he would kill the policeman and help Jim escape with him. That was one of his plans that he told his cellmate. Right. Ratted on him. Yeah. Now, during the sentencing hearings, Jim Parker wept, and he did apologize for his part in the killings. But still, I don't know how that really matters too much. I mean, he was very heartless in killing that woman. Yeah, I mean, sure, you're, you're going to be remorseful because you've been caught and you're going to prison for a very long time. Right. It's easy in that sense to be remorseful. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I go back and forth with having sympathy for him. I can kind of see at that young age how you can easily be led astray by a peer that you look up to. That totally happens. But then to just kill people like that, that's, that's too far a leap for me. I can't really feel sympathy there. It is. Yeah. Exactly. It's a shame for his family. It's a shame for Robert Tullock's family as well, but I really can't feel sorry for them. 
No, I it, can't either. No. Robert Tullock, he showed no emotion and made no statement at his sentencing. Right. Now, interestingly enough, Parker and Tullock have been in the same prison in New Hampshire for the past few years. Now, they didn't start out, out in the same place. Actually, no. Jim was in a detention-type place for young people for a little while until he turned 17, I 17, think. I believe. Yeah. yeah. And then he went somewhere else. But now they're both at the New Hampshire State Prison for Men in Concord, New Hampshire. Right. And Tullock got transferred there because of his uh, escape plans. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. But he's in, I mean, they, they never see each other. They might be in no. the same facility, but... They have no contact because Tullock's at custody level four, right. so that's called close custody, and Parker's at custody level three, medium custody. Right. So Parker can go out and about the prison except for head counts and lockdowns at night. Yeah. And Tullock is in a different area and has fewer privileges. Yeah, he's like in his room for 22 out of 24 hours or something. Wow. Yeah. That's a long life he's going to have there. No kidding. Yep. Without parole. Yep. That's right. So the book we've been talking about, we keep saying the book, the book, the book. So I just wanted to recommend this book that we did read. It's called Judgment Ridge, The True Story Behind the Dartmouth Murders. It was written by Dick Lair and Mitchell Zuckoff. And it's a great book, I thought. Great read. Yes. Very, very. A lot of details that we easy, didn't even get into. Easy to read. We tried to get in a lot of details, but there are so many. Way too many. That you really need to read the book to get that. Yeah. Yeah. But I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. Now, we, we talked about the psychiatrist who was going to testify that he was bipolar. Yeah, I wanted you to tell us some more about and, that. I mean, not just bipolar, but I, I just was looking at some stuff about adolescent brain development. Yeah, I think that's very interesting because this whole thing of being tried as an adult, why do we have trials for people who are juveniles if we're not going to use them? I'm hearing all the time about 12-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 16-year-olds being tried as adults. But they're not adults, so why does that happen? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, because it definitely is a different stage of brain development. There, there is, although I, I would caution people not to oversimplify things. Yeah. And, and not, not say, I mean, they, they do know that there's differences in adolescent brain versus adult brains. Yes. But... And not all adolescents with immature brains can rein in their impulses. Okay. Okay. So it's it's not simple. As no, that confuses me, I mean, me you the can, way you're saying that. All right. I'll say it this way. Yeah. Because I mean, the, the theory is that adolescent brains aren't well developed and they lack impulse control. That's the theory. So you're saying it's so, something different. So, no, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that's an oversimplification. Okay. That... There's plenty of adolescents that have impulse control, even though they don't have mature brains. Oh, of course, And there's, yeah. there's plenty of adults that lack impulse control, even though they they have fully mature brains. Okay. So it's it's not a simple thing. So it's not a broad generalization. No. I see. But the, there are definitely differences. We used to think that a brain was fully formed by age five or six. And... It's not quite that true. I mean, probably 95% of the brain is fully formed. Okay. But there's some additional growth that occurs during puberty. And the papers I read, they were looking at three areas where there was additional growth that might impact behavior. The one was the prefrontal cortex, which this is a part of the brain that's just behind the forehead. And it, it acts, as these uh, authors of the paper say, as the chief executive officer of the brain, controlling planning, working memory, organization, and modulating mood. And as it matures, a person can reason better, develop more control over impulses, and make better judgments. So, again, if you oversimplify it and say, well, it's an adolescent brain, so they lack impulse control and, and lack the ability to make a good judgment. It, yeah. isn't, it isn't that easy. Okay. Then there's a part of the brain called the corpus callosum, which is in the middle of the brain. And it's a fiber system that relays information between the two hemispheres of the brain. And it has some effect on language development. And then the cerebellum, which is a very interesting part of the brain. It sits way at the back at the base of the brain. Mm -hmm. 
we know that it helps with physical coordination. But they, they have all these fancy x-rays and CAT scans and MRIs and PET scans and everything. And they can see that uh, when a person is performing certain mental tasks, the cerebellum has more activity. Mm. So there's, there's some good stuff. Yeah. Um, but it, again, it's, it's probably oversimplifying things to say that an adolescent who kills somebody did it because they have an immature brain and lack the, the impulse control. Yeah, but how do you determine that? Is there are there psychiatrists that can talk to somebody and determine that? No, no. So, so how are they determining that these people should be tried as adults? I don't get it. Well, you know how they do that. How? The more horrific the crime, the more likely it is that the kid's going to be tried as an adult. That doesn't make sense to me. I know. Because it's a worse crime doesn't mean that they're more mature or should be held more responsible not for in, it. Not in the least. So I think that's a flaw in our system, unless I'm missing something big. No, it's a flaw in our system. You think so? Yeah. I, mean, I, I think they should be able to say, if you're younger than this age, you get tried as a juvenile, and if you're older than this age, you get tried as an adult. I would think so. Um, and, and you don't differentiate between the types of crimes or the, the callousness of the crime. I, I kind of think you're right, because... Well, for Jim Parker, he was 16, so he's more borderline. But when they're 12, 13, 14, I just think it's incredible that you would try a 13-year-old, for example, as an adult. They're not an adult. They're nowhere near being an adult. No. And they're not able to do... They might not even have gone through puberty. So I don't understand that. We both don't. No. I think we should look more into the laws about that because I find that really compelling, interesting how they're how that works. Okay. So let's look into that. It's a good idea. Okay. So I guess that's all we have to say about this case now, then. I think so. Yeah. And again, there's there's a horrific crime that's been committed, and we've got the perpetrators put away for many many years. Yes. But then, what happens to Jim Parker when he comes out in ten years? I hope he's getting therapy in prison. That's if he comes out in 10 years. All, all we know for sure is that his first opportunity for parole is yeah. in 2016. True. 2026, excuse me. Yeah. So it's it's by no means a guarantee that he's going to be released. No, but so it, it could happen for sure. It could. Because it seems like he's been good in prison. Yeah. Yeah. I so, just hope that he's getting help is all I'm saying. Well, While he's there. That's that's a whole other topic. We can talk about that. <laughs> yeah. You, you, Punishment you, versus rehabilitation. You, you name a crime and, and somebody gets out for it, what can they do? Right. And so you, you want to open up some some worms. Yeah. There. I mean, you drive a getaway car in a robbery and you're in jail for 10 years or whatever, and you get released, mm -hmm. you're a convicted felon. You can't get a job. Really? You can't rent an apartment or buy a house? Yeah, it's and tough. So that's one thing. Yeah. Say you're a more dangerous person and you get released. Mm -hmm. Who watches you? Right. And, and they have parole officers, but it's still kind of voluntary that the person shows up and visits with the parole officer. Absolutely, yeah. So somebody could get released and vanish. and commit crimes again. Yes. Which has happened. Yes, and I wonder what the the recurrence rate is. I know with um things like child abduction pedophilia, there's a really high recurrence rate. There's a high recidivism rate, yeah. Yeah, but there's no but there's no cure for that. There doesn't seem to be any therapy that really helps that that well, we know of. Yeah, we've talked about therapies for it. Yeah. And you know, there's there's some cognitive behavioral therapy type of stuff and Maybe medication. Yeah. But no, there, there isn't. Right. But we're starting to wander far afield here. Yeah, I know. Okay. Well, it's just interesting to me. But I'm definitely really interested in this idea of being tried as an adult. That's something. Okay. Yeah. And also we had, um, we had a listener write in about the felony murder rule. 
That's something we're considering going into soon, is one of our episodes. And tell me again what the felony murder rule is. Well, I haven't really looked into that much yet, so I don't know specifically. But in general, it's if you're with someone committing a crime and the other person kills somebody, you're also tried as a murderer and get the same uh, punishment. Right. So like you said, with a driver. Yeah, we've talked about that, haven't we? Yeah, because yeah. we kind of have differing opinions on this, so it'll be interesting to do. We do. Yeah. So if you're driving a friend of yours to a bank to rob the bank, and he ends up murdering someone in the bank, you're going to get charged. You can go with to murder. prison for life for first degree murder. Yeah. Crazy. I know some people don't think it's crazy. Like you don't think that's crazy, but it's it's something to talk about for sure. Yes. Yeah. All right. We'll okay. Do, we'll do that. So we got some homework assignments here. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let me just talk a few minutes about ways to support True Crime Brewery and Tie Grabber. So Send, Sending beer is one way. Sending beer is one way. And also, if you go to our website, tiegrabber.com, you can go to the Team Tie Grabber Perks page. And there we have three levels of support that start with $2 a month. And with that support, you receive either a sticker or a coaster or the beloved snifter for your support. And another way is to go to our website and click on some of the Amazon links we've added. Right. I mean, if you're going to do some shopping at Amazon anyway, do it through Tide Grabber and help give us some money. Yeah, we get a little bit of money back and you don't have to pay anymore. It comes from Amazon. Right. So we have a link on the front page that, for example, it's Amazon gift cards. So if you click on that, you're going to go right to the Amazon site where you can buy a gift card. You can put in the amount. If you're a Prime member, it gets shipped to you within like two days. Like we've said, it's a great gift for someone you don't know what to buy for because they can buy whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a little link where it says Shop Amazon and Support Tie Grabber. So if you click on that, you can go to our Amazon affiliate link, which is the same as the Amazon site. It just has our name in the URL so that we get a little bit of money back. You can buy whatever you'd normally buy through Amazon. At no additional cost. At no additional cost, and you get money back. There's also a few more links for joining the audiobook club, which I love. I'm an Audible customer. I use that all the time. And there's also a link for getting Showtime, a free month of Showtime anytime. And even though you don't pay and it's free, we get a little money just for you trying it out. Yeah, and I think and that's who knows, on. You might like Showtime. I like Showtime. Well, it's got some good stuff on it. Yeah, we watch Ray Donovan, The Affairs coming up soon, Shameless. What else is on there? There's a lot of stuff on there. And, of course, movies, which are great. Mm -hmm. Homeland. And I think that link is actually on our On True Crime movie page, which is on the same website. You click to that. There's a link where you can do that if you're interested in trying that out. So many ways. So many ways to help us. Thank you for listening to this episode of True Crime Brewery. This podcast is available on iTunes. If you like the podcast, follow us on Twitter at Tigerber Pods. Also on Instagram, Tigerber Podcasts. We also have a Facebook page, and I try and update that a couple times a week. You can see that page. You can give us a like. That's at facebook.com forward slash Tigerber Podcasts or Tigerber.com forward slash Facebook, whichever way you want to put it in. Okay, I'll yeah. find it. Also on iTunes, all five-star reviews are appreciated. And if you submit one, we're going to happily read it on the air, and we're going to welcome you personally to the brewery. So you can come on down to the quiet end and join our discussion. What could be better? Yep. So as always, thank you for listening so much, and we will be back soon. All right, see ya. Bye-bye.